I got a call one year and said, no, it's absolutely amazing that the pilgrims would invite the natives over in order to slaughter them all. And so they killed them all. I said, well, first of all, you obviously aren't aware of many facts. I said, first of all, there was 90 natives that came over and only 51 pilgrims that were left. And there were several women and children. There's no way that would have <laughs> happened. I said to one Christian, who was really all upset about all the football games on Thursday. I said, I said, well, maybe you should say to the guy while you're watching whatever game you want to watch. And you say, you know, it's actually historically accurate to have some recreation on Thanksgiving. <laughs> and they said, I would never want to admit that. I said, well, maybe you need to humble yourself and admit it. <laughs> Hello to everybody watching and listening right now. Welcome to the podcast. Happy Thanksgiving. This is our Thanksgiving special. We are hope you're having a wonderful day. I uh, hope uh, enjoying food, family, and football. Today, we have got a very special guest joining us. He's an author, historian, pastor of New Testament Church, and founder of the New Testament School in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Also, I hear you're known as the, the Pil Pilgrim Paul. Dr. Paul Jaley, uh, sure. thank you for coming oh, on the great. podcast. Great to be here. See, it's good. And yeah. I know both of you guys and uh, had one of them in class, but... Just one, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you went to the school here the senior year, right? Yes, junior year and senior year. Okay. So it was uh, definitely something I needed to, to have. So yeah, that's, it was, uh, yeah. That's actually how we got, we got connected. You, <laughs> sure, you introduced sure. us when I... I, I've talked about the rally that we put on in June sure. on the podcast before, so yeah. I was talking to you about it. You were one of the pastors that graciously allowed me to speak, so sure. thank you for that. Oh, there awesome. are there are yeah. some pastors who weren't so kind, so I, I appreciate you being <laughs> being willing to. Uh, well, for me to be engage. called kind, that's a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm not. But <laughs> I understand that. So today, I, there are a lot of people in the, in our world. Since the, this is our Thanksgiving special, there are a lot of people who are just either misinformed about Thanksgiving or completely uninformed. You know, they went through the public sure. school system. You, you've we've all seen those like PragerU videos of people on the street being like, "Who's George Washington?" And they're like, "Uh, I don't know." Or like, uh, you know, when when did the Pilgrims come to America? And it's like right. 1900s. Right. Like a lot of people just don't know. And I so I, I I figured we would take this time to just I don't know. Like you're an historian. Like what's the history? You know. Sure. So we'll start at the beginning. Uh, what is what was the first Thanksgiving? Uh, and why is it important to us today? Well, the, the first Thanksgiving is normally attributed to the October festival. We think it's probably October of 1621. And this was a at least a three-day uh, harvest festival. And um, most of the t periods you talk about, you know, people who are, uh, do not know what it was or whatnot, we generally have usually several problems. We have a, a problem where uh, people just ignore it and just skip over it. You know, everything's moving to, to Christmas now. It's even before Thanksgiving, and yep. people just ignore that it hasn't happened. Or they overemphasize only one thing out of context, or they just simply outright say things that are, aren't true, you know? Mm -hmm. um, there's no evidence, for instance, I, I got a call one year uh, and said, no, it's absolutely amazing that the, the, the pilgrims would invite the natives over in order to slaughter them all. And so they <laughs> killed them all. I said, well, first of all, you obviously aren't aware of many facts. I yeah. said, first of all, there was 90 natives that came over and only 51 pilgrims that were left. And there were several women and children. I don't think they were that good. They, there's no way that would have <laughs> happened. And so um, it's a, um, there's an ignorance in it. But I would say the significance of this uh, is unique. It's not unique that... Um, a group would give thanks to God once they came here. That happened in Berkeley Plantation before the pilgrims. Happened among natives. Natives thanked God, and they thanked, and the Wampanoags here, according to the pilgrims' own own writings, the Wampanoags believed in a creator. Um, um, the pilgrims actually believed that they, they both prayed to the same God. Wow. It's just they didn't know the Redeemer. Okay. And so to the pilgrims, they were not, um, at first they thought these people, the natives were here, were did not, believe anything about God, had no real religion, and they later said, no, that was wrong. That's not true. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, people are, don't see the context of that. So the real significance is not simply that somebody came here and thanked God when they got here. That wouldn't, that, then this would not be the first Thanksgiving, because, and it's certainly not the first time people gave thanks to God. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's not what makes it unique. I think when looking at it historically in its time period, what makes it so unique is we have a multicultural three-day feast, which means now, if you're going to cordially just say hello to somebody that you can't really stand, you're not going to go do it for three days. <laughs> Second, 
you're not going to sit and feast together. And according to the Bradford and Winslow's accounts in, their, in the primary sources, natives brought most of the food. They brought five deer in. The, the pilgrims what, they hadn't gotten much of a crop. They, they, weren't, they had just learned how to plant the crop. So this is not like a, an invited banquet where four adult women, the only left, left alive, have to serve 100 and, you know, you have 90 braves and you have about 50 pilgrims. So imagine Thanksgiving of 140 people. Wow. I mean, you got 140 people and four adult women serve them all. No, that's probably not the case because they didn't have that much food. So the natives were coming in, bestowing upon them all these deer and fowl because they knew how to hunt. Mm -hmm. You got to have some friend, friendship on that. You know what I mean? If you go over to somebody's house for Thanksgiving and you bring all the food, yeah, you like them pretty much. I mean, you know, you're gonna you're gonna do that. So we look at this and say it's unique in that regard. It's also unique because it uh, there's a phrase that Bradford used that we exercised our arms, and what that simply means is. We probably had a contest, a recreational contest. Um, we like to say, gee, maybe they had a bow and arrow contest. Natives probably took that one. Uh, maybe they had a, uh, a rifle contest. Now eh, the English probably took that. You know, those kinds of, and by the way, they never kept score, so we have no idea what that was like. Maybe it was wrestling match. Maybe, but again, to have that kind of a friendship that you would have a recreational time means that it was more than superficial. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and we deal with that. And I often say to people who are, are so upset that Thanksgiving today has so many football games, it's actually historic to have some recreation and oh, athletic really competition. So you know what, I, I kind of um, bolster some of the men who get really ribbed on all this, and, and women today yeah. as well. Yeah. But the point is that uh, that doesn't mean it should go to idolatry or go to mm -hmm. the fiendish uh, obsession that some people have. So I think I look at this and I'd say it's multicultural. Uh, that makes it unique. It's um, uh, friendly. That would make it a little deeper than, than most. Recreational, a three-day feast. Uh, it happens on both ends now. Uh, for instance, I got a call one time where uh, an individual uh, called me up and just said, hey, look, uh, I've gone to a historic museum here in Plymouth, and they're telling the story all wrong. And I said, what do you mean? And actually, I got the call from the historic museum that calls me up and said that we're having an ornery Christian here who's causing us problems. And I said, uh, what do you mean? And I knew the historian that called me. And he said that this Christian is coming in saying that this was a three-day fast, and we're saying it was a three-day feast, and he thinks that we're revising history. Hmm. I said, put him on the phone. This is the Christian. So they put the Christian on the phone. I said, listen to the historian. He's right. You're wrong. And you're trying to make this into something that it wasn't. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And this, so we see the error on both sides. Yeah. You know, you see the error on the, on the case that, um, no, let's say for what it was. It was a harvest festival. Now, there's a lot of origins of that har the harvest festival you could go into. But the idea was uh, they had it in October. It was not primarily a prayer meeting. It was not primarily a time. They weren't spending three days on their knees. Mm -hmm. They're feasting. There's more references in the Bible to feasting than fasting. I kind of like that, man. <laughs> the point is that uh, there's, there, are, there are things that you... So there are several things that would make this unique, and it isn't often what people think, but it really is good for America because when you go back to what it really was, and we don't make it up that, they, that, that we have no idea that the pilgrims sent out invitation slips to the natives to get them to come. We, we don't know who invited whom. We don't have that kind of a record. But what we can emphasize is Two completely different cultures that come from completely different backgrounds. And the native culture, I tip my hat to, because they had been robbed. They had been robbed only a few years before by a man who, who tricked them into trading on their ship, and they took 22 natives as captives in wow. chains and made them slaves over in Europe. Was that was Squanto, Squanto one of them? Right? Yeah, Squanto was one of them. Okay. And this is back in uh, you know 1614. Okay. And this is prior to the pilgrims coming. Yeah. And that's only six years before. I mean... Uh, the fact that um, natives on Cape Cod fired their arrows on the pilgrims as they were exploring is, is, is you, you don't have to say, why would they do that, such terrible people? No, they're, it isn't self-defense. They have a right to self-defense. Mm -hmm. And they see the same kind of people that robbed them before. How do they know they're any yeah. different? So yeah. was, was Thanksgiving actually, like, should, th do you think Thanksgiving should still be like a three-day feast? Well, I mean, I, I, if you really wanted to be historic, you'd have to eat some of the same meals. And so there would be fish there. There was wild turkey. Uh, there, there would there probably popcorn. 
and probably cranberries okay. because the natives were very good with the cranberries. They called them the bitter, bitter berry, but it was very nutritional and healthy. And for the and and probably Quatakina, Massasoit's son brought the popcorn. I mean, or and, and so and because they they put it in there. We we don't know historically. We can't footnote every one of these. So as an historian, I would always say it's probable. We don't know for sure. Okay, uh, but. You know, to, to call it a three-day feast, yeah, I mean, it would be legitimate historically if you really wanted to have a three-day feast. Most people have a one-day feast, and that's enough. But uh, come back to your con initial point, what makes it unique is harmony between cultures that didn't know each other, and especially a native culture that had been robbed yeah. and had been wronged. You think of that and say, how much does our nation need that kind of a right. reminder of unity and harmony? We don't have to agree on everything. We don't have to be politically in line with each other. We don't need all that. What we need to do is to say, listen, we're all here and we're all blessed. And they most likely they prayed. The pilgrims would have done anything without praying. They don't look at anything as secular. And the natives probably did so too. Yeah. And, and so that, that's the kind of thing that we need today. Yeah, I think it's an interesting point that I think a lot of the people who are like trying to uh, rewrite the story of Thanksgiving who are against it, it's almost they're coming at it from like a Marxist view of like, well, the, the white man, the English were the oppressors. So the, the Native Americans, they shouldn't have feasted with them or they shouldn't have gave them forgiveness. But actually, the virtuous thing was what the, the Native Americans showed mercy and grace to the, the pilgrims. Because, I mean, the pilgrims were weak at that time, weren't they? They oh, could have yeah, taken them out. Oh, yeah. Half and, the people died, right? Yeah, so they see that and they say, oh, well, why did the Native Americans do that? Or the, the white man is evil. But in reality... The virtuous thing would be to do what the natives it's, did, and they should be commended for that. Yeah. The thing is that, and forgiveness racially, right? Uh, not because the pilgrims did it personally, but here's something else. There's two historic events that aren't often linked with Thanksgiving that are very, very important. One is the peace treaty in March of 1621. So this is months before. Right. I, I, I contend if there had been no peace ratified with Massasoit and the pilgrims, there would have been no Thanksgiving. Mm. Uh, the pilgrims. See, the pilgrims came here. Um, there, there had been a, a, a terrible, terrible papal bull of 1452, years before even Columbus sailed, mm -hmm. and this was called the became known as the doctrine of discovery. And what that meant was, this doctrine of discovery uh, would allow. Uh, in fact, I'll read it because what it is, it it would allow Christians, so to speak. This papal bull uh, was done in such a way that. Um, it said the following, we grant you, and this is coming out of the Catholic Church at the time, not the Catholic Church of today, that would be different. We grant you, kings of Spain and Portugal, by these present documents, with our apostolic authority, full and free permission to invade, search out, capture, subjugate the Saracens, the pagans, and any other unbelievers and enemies of Christ, wherever they may be, as well as their kingdoms, duchies, counties, principalities, and other property, to reduce their persons into perpetual servitude. Ooh. So what it's saying is, because they have wronged us in the past, these people, and some of them that attacked the Catholic Church and goes back to the, some of the Crusades and all those kinds of things, that it is legitimate on behalf of Christ to make them your slaves, take their property, and then introduce Christianity to them. No. So, but think about that. Because that doctrine of discovery gave this permission, this imperialistic, top-down idea of conquering people in the name of Christ. So you can have to understand here now, 200 years later, you have the pilgrims coming. They're facing 200 years of unfortunate reputation of Christianity. Now here it brings out a key point that most people overlook. Christians, when they act like idiots, do a disservice to the testimony of Christ. It causes us years to overcome those reputations to be trusted. Yeah. I mean, I mean, people do all kinds of things in the name of Christ. And, 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 and today, they just slap Christian on anything. Yeah. And they just abracadabra, it's now Christian. Well, isn't that taking the Lord's name in vain? Yeah, exactly is. Of course of it is. Commandment. It is. It is a violation of that commandment. And so you have to realize the context of the pilgrims coming here. They, uh, Robert Cushman, one of their agents, wrote a treatise defending why the pilgrims could come here. The number of people don't know this, and here's why. People were saying, well, why are the pilgrims going? Because they, they were, look, the pilgrims were a church plant. 
from Leiden, Holland. So this New England was founded upon a church plant. Mm -hmm. Not everybody was Christian on the on the uh, or necessarily a part of their church on the Mayflower, but they were going to come here, and you're you're going to say, and the people in England were saying, why go over there? We have plenty of people who don't know Christ in England. Why mm -hmm. go to a wilderness? Because it was looked at as a missionary endeavor. Mm -hmm. So how? Why are you going to take all these people out? And they just started to defend this. And uh, John White, which was a, an individual who wrote a lot of these treatises later, Robert Cushman was the first one in 1621 to write it because the pilgrims were criticized. Why would you come here? And he said, listen, we have to be very careful. We are going because you should go wherever God calls you to go to preach Christ. But you better have the character to portray an example of Christ. And Cushman wrote in there, you can't take land from the natives. You've got to procure a peace agreement with them. You need to go to land that's been abandoned and not land that is being contested. And he wrote these standards. This was the attitude in which the pilgrims came, which was a reversal of the doctrine of discovery. You follow me? Yeah. And it's written. It's not like we are making conjectures. These things were written. Were they perfect? No. Was there a, still a sense of a bit of arrogance from Europe to the natives that they probably, they didn't have a written language? They did Yeah, I mean, there's no question about that. So it's not perfect. History isn't perfect. And I'll get into that because whenever you interpret history, you have to be very careful. But I think the critical thing is you have to realize what preceded it. So to have peace, the pilgrims were seeking peace because that was their motive. Mm -hmm. And when they first met the natives on Cape Cod, the natives ran away because they thought, okay, these guys, they're carrying Same guns. Thing. They're carrying guns. Mm -hmm. And the pilgrims started running after them. You know, a native doesn't wear as much clothing as the pilgrims. They're dressed warmly. They're in cold weather. They've got armor on. <laughs> you can see the native, they're gone, okay? They ran for a living, all right? The Englishmen didn't. And you recognize that, um, and yet you, you can see the idea, of why are these people here? Why do they, they want to do that? Then they fire on them in self-defense. The pilgrims get shipwrecked. They, they end up landing in Plymouth, and then that's a critical event. But now you have to understand the second critical event. So that's March of 1621. Okay. Now we have go to August of 1621. And Bradford has this hunger and desire to say, you know, we took some of the corn that we found in the sand of, the, of Cape Cod. It's around the same place we got attacked. We need to make this right. The, the, um, though it wasn't us, this guy Thomas Hunt, who hunted natives, can't make this up. But <laughs> this guy, Thomas Hunt, had come down here, had wronged the natives. And, um, and so Bradford seeks a meeting. Now, there's, there's several things that happen. One of the kids on the Mayflower from the most undisciplined family in the Billingtons ran away into the woods. Well, they didn't realize that natives were watching everything the pilgrims did, but the pilgrims didn't know. The English didn't know that they were being watched. Everything. You imagine, you just don't know how good these people are, okay? I mean, they're really good at what they do. So then, so he gets taken by the natives. And so they find out, they, they, because of the peace treaty, they contact Massasoit. And they say, we have the boy who ran away, but they have our corn. Mm -hmm. See, in other words, we know you took that corn out. Now, pilgrims discuss this among themselves and in common law. There's this idea, you're starving, you know your, your corn is not going to grow. The only reason they could have taken that, if they were true to their convictions, was to promise to repay. Mm. You know, That's how diligent the pilgrims were in one sense. Yeah. So now Bradford says, okay, here's, a, here's, our, here's our opportunity. We're going to go down there. We want to retrieve the boy, but we want to repay. Mm. But when they went down there, they did more than that. They didn't just repay them. What they, what they did was, Bradford gets up and he makes this little mini speech that what the English did was wrong. They should not have taken those individuals. It should not have been done. And, and you will not expect that from us. If we would gain all the beaver skins in, in the world, we will not harm you. So here's something very interesting that's left out of the history book, yeah. okay? That there's an apology coming from one race to another. Now, Native even conservatives today, you go back, might say that's a little exactly. Weird. That's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's why are you apologizing? You didn't do it. Yeah, but they knew the scriptures. Why did Daniel then repent for the sins of his people in Babylon? He didn't do it. He was one of the righteous guys, but he owns the sin of his culture, 
And that, I believe that that August, we could call it a reconciliation service, but we at least could call it an apology, that that um, August event is what precipitated the, the Thanksgiving. You follow me? Yeah, you can't absolutely. just have an isolated event that drops out of nowhere yeah. and everybody sits down. This way, some of the criticism of Thanksgiving today is that it just wasn't a happy meal that happened overnight. No, it didn't. It's, that's correct. It was a culmination but, of many, many yes, events. Yes, and year. motives. Yeah. Um, no wonder the natives had known. And for 200 years, Christianity had suffered with this reputation. You just go and you conquer people, and then you make them your slaves, and you, then you call them Christians. And, it, and are they really converted? Or are they really not? I mean, even Columbus, he had noble motives, but he had government that was top down. He, he was not a, 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 an individual that was a product of the Reformation. Partially, maybe, but not completely. Mm -hmm. So you have this, uh, this whole idea. So I think Thanksgiving deserves some context. And I'll probably throw in this right here. That, you know, when you interpret history, and this is what people are missing, because people can say anything today, you have to interpret history in its own context. Right. In other words, you have to take yourself back to the 1620s, when there were no jet airplanes, when there were no motorboats, when there were no... You take that out and you say, I need to hear what happened in history at that time period. What did they know? What didn't they know? What uh, areas? So it has to be interpreted in its own context. Yeah. The second thing we look at it, you have to have more than one witness to an event. So when I say probably, uh, that August event, of course, wasn't written down by the natives. We have one side. We have the English side. So we can be fairly certain because of the um, accuracy in other areas of how they portrayed it that it most likely occurred. But ideally, it would be great to have three eyewitnesses, two or three, the two or three witness principle you know what I mean? Before we fully establish something or say, say I'm going to die on this hill or that kind of thing. And then third, then when we know that, we can apply the principles and the lessons we learn mm -hmm. without having to repeat the history. Does that make yeah. sense? And, I, and that's exactly how we interpret the Bible. Yeah. And I feel like the division comes from the extremes of one side. Like the left might say, oh, the natives were completely wrong. Like you're lying about the true history. They were killed and all these things. And that's partially true. And the right will say, oh, well, they were right to, like, they were stronger. They could have that land. They were just trying to survive. And, like, you'd come up. But in reality, it's a little bit of both. And to know that the pilgrims actually were seeking peace, that the natives kind of, they forgive them in a way. Yeah, I mean, no, and that no, was, they, yeah. yeah. And think of what we're talking about. We're not talking about 20 years. We're talking about the natives had a decision. And yeah. you have to, you read, you read the books that are written by native historians. They had a decision to make after having 22 of their young men stolen from their tribe. Notice this, at that reconciliation time in August, a 100-year-old woman started weeping and turning away her eyes from the pilgrims, from the English. And Bradford asked, why is this woman weeping and why does she turn away? They said, because she had her sons and her grandsons stolen. And she's deprived of them in her old age. This, these are real things, this yeah. is real stuff. Human. Today, we look at it and we and say, yeah, you know, it could have happened 150 years ago and we still don't forgive. I mean, this is a matter of weeks. And then in October, they're having this festival, this harvest festival. You've got to give a lot of credit to the natives 100%. For, for forgiving. And you give credit to the pilgrims for owning, even though they didn't do it. Right. Okay? The sin of their culture. Owning the sin of their culture. That's huge. And now think of this. If that context was portrayed today, on both taking in both sides of the story, how much could that speak as a lesson to today? I mean, because you could play the game, the blame game all day. Yeah. And uh, I think it's someone who talks about like, um, even if you it was only ten percent like uh, your fault, ninety percent the other person's fault. Own a hundred percent of your ten percent. Ten percent. Yeah. Right. And it's like that's exactly. the principle, like. And what, what providence of God for the natives to free? Like, they could have, have had every oh, they, justification to say... They had to decide. Can yeah. we, we wipe them out now and they then end this whole thing? Yeah, and, and the history would have gone down and said, here's why. They were justified. Thomas Hunt, now, yeah. notice in context, too. When Thomas Hunt went back to Europe with his slaves, quote, no Englishman would even look at him. They considered him a traitor. Wow. And he would walk down the street and they'd throw gloves at his feet. Back then, that simply meant, hey, dude, we're having it out. 
Yeah. <laughs> you don't. So he was not a respected a man. respected yeah. hero either in England, even though he was unfortunately quote typical of some of the imperialistic you know practices of Europe. Europe is no innocent party in this whole thing. I mean, it's yep. been a mess. But what we need to learn as Christians, from a Christian perspective, we can see. Gee, you know, yeah, we have to own own the, the sins of our own people who do things in the name of Christ, and they're jerks. We're going to call them idiots for who they are. I don't mean to be crass, but the idea is we can <laughs> say, no, you're not living out your faith. Yeah. And if you're not living out your faith, you're going to damage future generations for advancing the kingdom. Yeah, you know, so that, you, you brought the, up unity uh, between um, how, how the main idea of Thanksgiving was between cultures. You're unifying right. those cultures. You might argue as you know as a Christian, oh, you had a pagan culture and then you had a Christian culture trying to come together, and you can compare that to today. I, I hear so many people the the common thing is like, oh, I got to go to Thanksgiving, got to deal with my liberal cousin, you know, exactly. my blue haired whack job liberal yeah. cousin, or or the other way, oh, I got to go deal with my my crazy you know lo- right. MAGA uncle, let MAGA He's Trump uncle. scripture the entire meeting. Yeah, I know. So it's like <laughs> people on both sides exactly, but at the same time, he's like, look at the first Thanksgiving. They were exactly. completely different. Totally. Like religious, like in every way. I, I guarantee they were probably completely different in their right. beliefs. Yet uh, they came together. Exactly. That's I had awesome. one, relative, one person say to me, yeah, I'm completely outnumbered. I've, it's like I, all my liberal family members, I said, so, so are the pilgrims. So, <laughs> Two to one, baby. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, they were completely outnumbered. And yet look at it as a blessing, not a curse. This is the same thing. What brings people together? A meal, uh, a Thanksgiving feast. Um, that this is a good thing that brings us together and learn to talk to one another. Uh, think about it. They they had Samoset as an interpreter initially, and eventually, eventually Squanto would be a, an interpreter. But um, so they had a way to communicate. And you can imagine, just imagine around the dinner, dinner table where they're, they're they're thanking, and the natives said, "No, this is how we prepare this." So they're bringing some food. Yep. Oh, wow, this is how they prepare it. Well, you know, the four women, four adult women that are left alive are looking at this and saying, we're going to have to learn some recipes here in the New World because the stuff we had from England, this is not going to work. And yet they had pots and pans that they had brought. Certain, now, most of the dishes were wooden. Mm-hmm. Another fact, by the way, the first Thanksgiving, because it was a tradition, that when everybody got ready to, to eat, of course, you'd pray, you'd, you'd do an invocation, and the natives probably did that as well. Um, the children served the adults. Really? Yeah. So the younger children, they were being trained to serve the adults. So the adults would sit down for the meal, and the children would come over and, and would serve. That'd be a good thing to practice uh, at a Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because it's the, the pilgrims were very, very conscious. This had nothing to do with Thanksgiving. They were conscious in their family traditions on raising their children to be servants mm-hmm. and to have character. And today, it's t- tough to keep children from eating before you at least pray or they or they go first in line or although those kinds of things and we'd say oh it's terrible to have a child have to wait for an adult no that's not necessarily the case it's a little diversion here but it's 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 that's an interesting it's 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 they they believed in voice obedience which meant that a calm voice from the mother or father a low voice say the name sam (laughs) yes mom (laughs) <laughs> yes, mother. They wouldn't say mom, mother, mm-hmm. or a calm from the father uh, to come to the field, and not yelling like, Sam! <laughs> I mean, this is what we're used to today. And yet, it's not condemnation for where we are. It's just, this is the, the kind of, so there's a lot of nuances about Thanksgiving, what have been there, the meal and things that people can read. We've got all those things are written down and we, a lot of people have done a tremendous amount of research on that, those kinds of things. And the fact that it's three days involves recreation. Mm -hmm. So we're doing a broader context, but I think it's pretty significant. When you ask that, that, that the things that we're talking about that preceded this, and then think of the things that followed it, because with that Thanksgiving meant there was some friendship here. And that meant you know, when Massasoit gets sick, pilgrims send their doctors over there. Um, when, when Squanto acts strange, Squanto was a kind of self-serving guy. He was, he was an interpreter, but he'd run into the plantation and with blood, it's really animal blood, smeared on him saying that the natives are going to violate the treaty and they're going to come in and kill all the pilgrims. And I, I'm, I just barely made it here. Pilgrims, they get there, they're, they're going, oh my gosh, I can't believe Massasoit would do that. But they do that. And he said, wait a second, don't go out there yet. Let me see if I can stop them. Wow. He runs back into the woods. 
Then he comes back. I stopped them. Oh, they were coming. They were never coming. He just wants to them to say, "Whoa." This, I mean, we have no, we don't have anybody like this today that would. No, do this no, no, that's what I think about. Like, I mean, like the power interpreters oh my have. Word. This is. Uh, I'm not. I'm a real noble person. <laughs> well, Massasoit, he wanted him dead when he found out that he, because that was a violation of the treaty. I mean, and you know, and Brad was like, "What am I going to do that if he if he kills the interpreter? <laughs> what yeah. am I going to do?" But the whole idea is, you need to see the drama and all this, that because they trusted each other enough. The pilgrims were questioning, what's going on here? What's this guy doing? Did he really stop? How, did he, have to, he was not even a part of the tribe. It was a miracle he was even taken in after his tribe had died. And they came to Plymouth because that land was kind of a graveyard. You know what I mean? So anyway, you can see the significance of this, I think, is lost on most Americans. Yeah, yeah and the, just, again, like the providence of God for them, like human, the human heart, how corrupt and how easy it is to hate the other side and make no peace and say, no, like we're, you did this to us. We did, you did this to yeah, us. Yeah. And it's like the ability for them, for both sides to somehow come together and have a three day feast is like, it's just a miracle basically. Yeah, and I, I want to read this one thing, yeah. uh, a, a historian friend of mine is not, this a, is your book by the way. You want yeah, to this is the book. Yeah. This is a, uh, a book called journey of faith, uh, which is a book I wrote for the 400th anniversary of the pilgrims coming. Basically the synopsis of this, I made it a short book. My wife was very important and insistent on that. She came up with a title and everything else because I don't do well in titles. But the thing is, I look at this and I said, I wanted to tell the story from the vantage point of this is a remnant church. It was 350 strong in Leiden. They sent out 75 to plant a church in the wilderness. All right, if you're going to send out a bunch of Christians to the wilderness to face all your issues, you're going to face reputations of what Christians have done in the past, everything we've talked about. Uh, how would you apply the Bible and set up a society? You know, when nobody's looking over your shoulder. In England, you had the bishops looking over your shoulder. You had the king. You couldn't really worship the way God had wanted you. You had 11 years to work it out in, Eng in, in Leiden, Holland, on how you would conduct your church service. How would you conduct your offerings? How would you conduct the biblical tithe, which was 23 and a third percent, not 10, as people don't know. But the point is, how do you work out that whole thing and apply it. That's what my goal was. So I take every, every section. So I talk about the doctrine of discovery. I talk about those things. I talk about what the pilgrims came by. But here's interesting. Uh, Jim Baker, who I've known for years, highly respect him. I, I could email him anytime to deal with this. He's an historian of Plymouth. And so he writes the forwards to my book. And what he says is he quotes, uh, he says, first of all, Dr. Paul Jelly's journey of faith fills a conspicuous void in the current public dialogue about what the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the Mayflower actually signifies. So he's saying nobody's covering the religious part of right. the pilgrim's motive. And then he quotes a UMass historian, uh, Professor Will Johnson, who says this, in our age of anniversaries, the ones with which it all began, namely Christian ones, face special obstacles, all right? Having forgotten how much uh, the notion of anniversaries owe to that of saints' days, secular planners seized the cult of anniversaries for themselves. Because public anniversaries have become secular occasions, Christians must bend over backwards if they are to commemorate their seminal figures without secularizing them. The preempting of the cult of anniversaries by secularists exemplifies the prevalence of non-Christian assumptions today. Think of that. This is, this is not a Christian writing here. Wow. This is very good observation that what has happened is the secularized, to leave out the Christian motives. That doesn't mean everything, every holiday is totally, thoroughly Christian. It just means if you leave out people's religious assumptions, you're leaving out a major part of history. Mm -hmm. Just about everything has a religious assumption. It may not be your religion. Yeah. Maybe someone else's. But it's religious. Well, the idea of atheism is very new. Yes. So it's like for most of human history, everything, whether it was pagan or Christian right. or anything in between, there was a worship of something in the metaphysical. And now we're in the age of like secularism, you know, where everything, you know, all the, the only things that are real is what you can observe with your five senses. But right. if you look at history through that lens, it just, it, it, it won't make any sense because like who, who believed that? Right, you, you've missed all the motives. Years ago, yeah. well, you'll know in some of the history classes. I'll always, I'll always 
put him on the spot. Okay, <laughs> but I'm, from, I'm ready from, for from this. The, yeah, but is the, the, what we see as the behavior in history is the symptom. It's the consequence. The cause is what was believed in the heart and taught to the children over two, two or three generations before that. You see, because cause and effect is, is one of the key principles that's left out of history today. We, we see the effect. We just say that's a terrible person, but we don't understand the cause. What is the quote? The education of one generation becomes the government of the next. That's right. That's yeah. Mr. Lincoln. But, um, but I, I want to read one more quote here. And by the way, this is uh, you, they, my books and my materials are on Plymouth Rock Foundation website, which is plymrock dot org. So if people want to go, they can check it out. We actually have sell a primary source document the Pilgrims wrote, which is the first thing they wrote at before, long before Love Plymouth Plantation came out, which is called Mort's Relation. It's a hardback. It is thoroughly footnoted. It's the story of the first Thanksgiving. It's the story of them exploring on Cape Cod. It has the whole story of that uh, August reconciliation service. It has all this information. You can take that one history book. It's a collector's edition. So it'll cost you a little money, but now you have it for the next 10 to 15 years to read to your family at Thanksgiving. Why not read to them? And don't just read, you know, we, um, our harvest being gotten in, our, our governor sends four men on fouling, and all the, the typical Thanksgiving description, which isn't very long. But you can read the other ones. It has the peace treaty in there. It has the whole text of it and the August event. That's the real context, you know what I mean? To look at it, how can we all get along at this table? Well, think about that. You know what I mean? You could do it. Not to become a total historian. I, you know, I'm totally guilty of that. But anyway, <laughs> the, the point is this. This is interesting. In 1820, at the 200th anniversary of the coming of the pilgrims, Daniel Webster was an orator here in Plymouth. And this was the founding of the Pilgrim Society. Now, the old colony club had been founded in 1769 to commemorate the pilgrims stepping on Plymouth Rock. But the Pilgrim Society is the one that um, everybody looks to today that has all the archives and all the books and that's where I studied for years. So the, Daniel Webster said this for the 200th anniversary. Now think about this today. Finally, let us not forget the religious character of our origin. So he thought we were forgetting it. Our fathers were brought hither by their high veneration for the Christian religion. They journeyed by its light. They labored in its hope. They sought to incorporate its principles with the elements of their society, to diffuse its influence through all their institutions, civil, political, or literary. Let us cherish these sentiments and extend this influence still more widely in the full conviction that that is the highest society which partakes in the highest degree of the mild and peaceful spirit of Christianity. Wow. Intertwine its principles into every area of life. And that you was know. 200 years after, and he was already saying they forgot. Then we better yeah. do it more, well, how much more today? Right. Oh, no kidding. After 400 years What's, of decline. Yeah, that gets me into the next question, which I wanted to sure. ask is, um, Thanksgiving wasn't a holiday until Lincoln, right? A national holiday? A regular holiday, correct. So right. was it celebrated before that? Still? Yes. Was yeah, it? We wouldn't say as Thanksgiving. Now, keep in mind, probably a good thing to distinguish this. In Puritan theology, which the pilgrims basically embraced, a thanksgiving service was giving thanks to God for his provision. Mm -hmm. Usually in, uh, that pr was preceded by a fasting, a humiliation fasting day, which meant not the day before, but filling it. Uh, and this became a tradition in New England that you would have in the spring a fast day. You would go before the Lord and you would fast, not feast. And you would ask God for a bountiful harvest. And you did this in about March in the spring. And then in the fall, you had a Thanksgiving day. And that was thanking God for the provisions, the for the harvest. Oh, that's okay? so cool. Okay, now, neither of these two are directly the origin of Thanksgiving because there was a third festival that took place and it took place in Europe. It took place in Holland, in Leiden. And the pilgrims saw this and it was a harvest festival. Now it actually dips into both of these because you're still thanking God for the harvest. But there was a Thanksgiving feast. Now, this has led some people. We cannot footnote this. So, and as an historian, I have to tell you that this is conjecture. However, there's one feast in the Bible called the Feast of Thanksgiving, and it always occurred in October. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles. Mm. It's very interesting that the pilgrims dated the new year in March around Passover. They followed the Jewish calendar. 
They were very, very strong proponents of Old Testament theology being fulfilled in Christ. Mm. So who knows? Like you bring out and you say, wow, this is so from a spiritual perspective, not just historic, it's pretty significant also. We can't say there's no reference that we have that Bradford says we were doing the Feast of Tabernacles. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I say it's probable, and I date my, I put out my historian friend who said he doesn't think so. But the point is, you can get these ideas and you get the, the, the uh, more breadth, you know, about how deep we could go into this. Yeah. But, but there's plenty of books to read. That people so, can, uh, so what inspired Lincoln then 240 well, years? Well, to back yes. to your, yeah. In 1720, there was a small feast in town to commemorate the pilgrims coming in December because, of course, they landed in December mm -hmm. in 1720. So in 1820, you'll see it again. You have 1870. 250th. So there are commemorations, but they're not necessarily, they're not called Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. You do have George Washington issuing his Thanksgiving proclamation for honoring in November. Now, he didn't refer to the pilgrims directly, mm -hmm. but the founders did have this. They had, they had proclamations of prayer, usually in the spring, proclamations of Thanksgiving in the fall for these two cornerstones. And that was done long before Lincoln. Right. So this was not a new thing. But Lincoln's caught on because of, uh, um, you know, uh, the author there, Hale, and all her, pro what she did to make it a, then it became a national Thanksgiving day. In a way, you see that, um, to me, I always understood, tell me if I'm wrong, but the reason Lincoln instituted Thanksgiving was was it was this after the Civil War that he yeah, did? Yeah, right during the Civil War. During the Civil War. So was it a way to unite? Did he, yes, do, did he look at this yes, as a possibility well, to unite the North and the South? Yes, we would say not necessarily to unite the North and the South. This was after the Battle of Gettysburg. So okay. this was very tough, a very tough time. Yeah. Gettysburg was a turning point. So um, I think that uh, Lincoln, there was no question, he had in his heart some aspect of reconciling the South to the North after the Civil War. And... Um, that would have been good because you had just vengeance. Even though the, I would say the North was right being abolitionists, the, the, the North was wrong in their vengeance to punish the South forever, to, you know, to say nobody should be a, a part of the government that participated in the South. So I think Lincoln was at the, in a place where he, he understood that reconciliation. So, yeah, I think you can tie in some of that. So now there's uh, some things, because we've talked about the history and we've got sure. the context. Yep. Yep. There's some, I have an article here from uh, someone who probably wouldn't agree with the things that no, you're talking about. Yeah. And um, it talks about how Thanksgiving celebrations by European settlers often marked brutal victories over native people. So it's saying that Thanksgiving wasn't always this good, great mm -hmm. thing. It was, they would, pilgrims or not pilgrims or the English would do it after slaughtering a bunch of natives. Is that historically accurate well, or is that? The point is, of course, did Europeans do that? Yes, that most victorious armies mm -hmm. will thank God for their victory, right. okay, in all contexts. So that's nothing new. <laughs> to limit it to Europeans over natives, I think, is very narrow, mm -hmm. okay, because historically, uh, that's, like, that's like saying that uh, slavery began in America, colonially. <laughs> slavery yeah. was pervasive worldwide, and, every, and every culture had slaves and, and, and enslaved people of all races. Mm -hmm. So... I would just simply say that, yes, were there Europeans that did that? Yeah, Doctrine of Discovery, I'm sure there were. And most, most armies would thank God. Now, to make it a racial thing specifically against natives, I think that's narrow. And, Meant to divide, uh, yeah, pretty that, much. That brings a divisiveness to it. Well, yeah, as far as I know, the, it, at first, slavery wasn't about race, right? It was just they, right. they went to Africa because it was convenient. As right. far as I can tell, right? Yeah, you're right. And the, yeah, exactly. And the point is, but if you go back to antiquity, it started right after the garden because the moment mm -hmm. in the Garden of Eden, because once sin enters, you're going to want control over somebody else. Yeah. Right. But to complete that thought, uh, later on, this is after the pilgrims, um, there, were, there was no question the natives were taken advantage of. There was no question that after King Philip's war, because of King Philip's war and the anger that the colonists what had, that? 1675, okay. that when that happened, uh, there's no question about that. In fact, the idea of um, the idea let's take it, the idea of redskins mm -hmm. is scalping a Native American in vengeance mm -hmm. and holding up their red skin. Wow. That's why people got upset. About know, the name. Their, yeah, because yeah. the point is it, it conjures up. But not 
but we can't do just one side because it's been both sides. Because the natives would come in and scalp. And, and, so, and so the idea we have to say is this. This gets into constitutional foreign policy, gets into the law of nations, gets into a biblical basis of an origin. If nations simply operate on vengeance, you did it to me, I'm going to do it to you. Yes, everybody's guilty of that, okay? Right. But then there's just lawless. Then we have, and see, today, when we talk about the Geneva Convention, that there are rules for warfare. But well, where'd that come from? I mean, who, who decides it's the rules of warfare? Well, you got to go back, it's deeper. That goes back to the law of nations. Where'd that come from? Why is that in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, that we only deal with war and foreign policy according to the law of nations? Well, what's the law of nations? You've got to go back because there's encyclopedias were written on the whole law of nations. James Wilson, founder, one of the founders who's very not known, wrote a whole book on the law of nations. And it's the law of nations is derived from the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, Matthew 7, 12. But also it's the, the second of the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And if that's true for you as individuals, it's true for nations. So all of a sudden this ethic starts rising up to say you just don't butcher so, and, but that doesn't mean everybody follows. Right. It. <laughs> so, how can we how can we rectify that? Because we've wronged the natives as a country in our history. So, going back to the spirit of the first Thanksgiving, where they, yes. uh, Bradford said what we did was wrong, even though it wasn't him. Right. How do we bring that back to today and say we've wrong? Like, how do we reconcile? Well, it's that? interesting you say that because there are some uh, natives who uh, we've talked with about this. I don't mean locally, but that uh, I think. Several things. Number one, we have to dis define when it was a state issue, when it was a federal issue. The Trail of Tears, the, the taking people off their homelands uh, unconstitutionally, violated, it's immoral, traipsing them across America, putting them on reservations where they're less than human and treated that way is all wrong. It's immoral. It's, right. It is against the law of God and it's, and it's improper. I think there has to be a national apology that comes at the federal level by people in power that says, this, we've got to make this right. And it's in context. So it doesn't brush stroke yep. and say every single thing was always the fault of one per. We have to get this, but we, we delineate where the faults were. We say, yes, for those English that uh, contaminated blankets and gave them to natives after 1675 and King Philip's War, that's murder. That was wrong. You knew if that was done consciously. Now there's questions of whether people knew it was contaminated or not, but the point is, these are wrong, and this needs to be made right, and therefore there should be an apology nationally. Now, the difficulty comes, of course, today, which would be a whole other podcast, is the issue of reparations versus restitution. The biblical concept of restitution versus the social justice notion of reparations, because reparations never ends. I mean, yeah. that, so that's a whole different. Topic. Well, yeah, because you're going to have a lot of Republicans saying to what you know you're saying we should do. First of all, I agree, I agree with you, but you're going to have a, a lot of people on more on the right saying, well, uh, you know, why why would we capitulate? You know, we're just we're just doing exactly what the left wants us. To do. The left wants us to apologize and you know just get on our knees and beg for mercy and like exactly. we're just we're just uh, it's passive and it's not not accomplishing anything. I would, I would say, say to that? people all the time that, first of all, um, as Christians, I'm not in the left-right game. I don't play ping pong that way. I don't care because uh, I'm not. I don't. I'm not labeled. I don't want to be labeled right wing or left wing. Neither one. If if, if you're left wing, you swing. You swing you're flying a circle. If you're right wing, you fly in a circle. <laughs> That's good. I, you don't That's go good. anywhere. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that, and I'm not I, into. I think there's as much corruption in the Republican Party as there is in the Democrats at different levels. So I'm not. Uh, I'm not saying all Republicans are bad. I'm not saying all Democrats are bad. I think that um, there has to be a third way, and that's kingdom, the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is what brings reconciliation. Yeah. So when I look at this, I say uh, the, the right wing, I, look, I've been in the discussions. We can't capitulate. I said, why don't we kneel to truth? Humble ourselves. And not just to extremes. Why are we constantly going from one extreme to the other? Why not, why not tell the truth in history? And that means going back to the original context, going back to the original discussion of what really happened as much as we know. And recognizing there's no event that's totally pure because no person is totally pure. Are the pilgrims totally perfect? Do I defend them as perfect? No. I don't think they should have dug up native graves on Cape Cod. 
Even though I know they were curious as to who was buried there, I think that's wrong. I think that uh, they probably, uh, although they did the best they could to communicate, they probably should have done more to communicate the best they could uh, to make things right. Even though at the peace treaty they did say they wanted to make things right, still there's probably more that could be done, but hindsight is always 2020. But then we have to be honest also that uh, what you had said earlier, Hunter, and that is the fact that we need to give honor where honor is due. Let's give honor to the natives for the forgiveness Amen. that they showed yeah. in such a short time. I mean, look, there's people who get bitter at people in church. I'm a pastor. I know all this, okay? They won't forgive in years, and yet they, we're talking about weeks. Yeah. yeah. How about a culture you don't even know, you don't even trust? They didn't deserve it. And, yeah. And the, the culture didn't deserve it. So, yeah. I mean, I, I have to say, with that context, gee, we, should, we could so have a message here. That's yeah. how we bring back the spirit of the pilgrims to here, as we say, we admit our faults, admit that we've done wrong because blessed are the peacemakers for yes. they shall be called the sons of God. And that's the, the principle. And I think that we have to say that because we always want to say, oh, well, we're right. Our side is right. You're wrong. You need to agree with us. And it's like, right. you're not going to get anywhere by doing no. that. You've got to give them the ground that, I mean, Absolutely. you sometimes you got to be humble and say, no, yes, you're, you're, you're right. We were exactly. wrong. Exactly. Now let's go both ways and admit where we're all wrong and, and uh, say where we agree. Exactly. That's what I shared this one time with, with someone, maybe the church or somewhere, and one person said, wow, I never knew 22 natives were taken captive by English. Now I understand. You can understand the bitterness that people have over the years, but Christ offers that reconciliation. Exactly. Yeah. That forgiveness because we've been forgiven. Yeah. So no group of people are perfect, but neither is it to say then that we never can find truth in those things. We, we can find truth in history and in that context. And I think that's where, bringing it down to the very practical, I think that's why if people around the dinner table were to read and tell the proper context, not that you, you know, you're sitting there, the food's getting cold, and you say, I have a half hour dissertation that I'd like <laughs> to give on before we eat. <laughs> no, but I think that um, sometimes it can be this simple. I said, I said to one Christian who was really all upset about all the football games on Thursday, I said, I said, well, maybe you should say to the guy while you're watching whatever game you want to watch, and you're, you're, you're digesting your dessert, and you say, you know, it's actually historically accurate to have some recreation on Thanksgiving. <laughs> and they said, I would never want to admit that. I said, well, maybe you need to humble yourself and admit it. <laughs> yeah. And then that's a good place to start. A what are you talking about? What do you mean? Well, there's, and that's the, you know, there's some implications here in the record that, oh, what does the record say? That's, that's the better right. time to bring it up yeah. than I think, and when the dinner's getting cold. Yeah. <laughs> We've been talking about like manhood and stuff on the sure. podcast. And I think that's the, the manly thing to do is to admit your faults. We all want to say, oh, like we want to st stand our ground and say we're right. Yep. But the thing that's actually going to bring peace is admitting that sure. you're wrong. And yeah. I think that's huge. I never even knew the William Bradford, the story of the reconciliation. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's amazing. amazing. Yeah, yeah. In, in closing here, I, uh, we got to let you go, sure. but, uh, we're bringing it, bringing it into new England where we're yep. a new England based podcast. We're trying to appeal to the, the sure. younger generation sure. of, uh, of Christians, conservatives, people on all sides sure. of the aisle. Yeah. Yeah. Where do we go from here? How do we bring the spirit of Thanksgiving and celebrating it today? Uh, how do we how do we revive the spirit that uh, of the Puritans? Well, I think I think the first thing is we need to just uh, take a step back and say, God, would you work something in me so that I'm I'm a, a greater hum, humble servant of yours and don't just arrogantly say what I know and think. Because I think that what happens is in the battle of the culture worlds, when we start out politically, first of all, we have to admit, politics is not going to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. it's, there's a role politics has to play, but it's exhaust. It's not the engine. <laughs> it's not the gasoline. If politics is the gasoline, we're going to polarize forever. We've got to take a step back and say, God, work on my heart. Help me to humbly recognize I don't know it all. Look, I look back and I say, I'm, I'm indebted to historians like Jim Baker and others. They might not share my faith exactly. We, we laugh over it. We, 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 we have great, I, I can name a ton of other historians. The issue is, I recognize that, and I recognize I stand on the shoulders of giants. Mm. And what I know, but I have to be humble enough to say, uh, when someone, an historian has come to me and just said, Paul, it's the wrong footnote. That, that, that's not accurate. Oh, please, help me correct that. Rather than, who do you do you know who I am? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? How stupid. Because they buy 10 times the historian I am. But the thing is, I think we have to be at that place of humility. I think that's where it starts personally. I think beyond that, I think Christians have to be better read. I think that very practically, they should be better read in the Bible, number one. 
Old and New Testament and the context. They should know the context of the stories of Jesus and not just take them out of context. Skilled in the and word of we truth. we violate the yeah. same things that we do in history with the scriptures. And then be read. Read the pilgrim story. Christians, know it. You know, get that little book, Mort's Relations. Sure, buy it from our website. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> but get that and that Mort's Relation thing and, and read it. Read it through yourself and then read it to other people. He better read. Yeah. I think that's also something. And I think ultimately um, sharing, like what you're doing. You're, you're reaching out. You're trying to inform people. And uh, you don't want to simply be labeled or like said, we're, just, we're just a bunch of right wing, always right people and and the left wing is always wrong of course that that's not true most of the time there's truth on both sides now we're seeing a lot of polarization today and a lot of people are pushing the envelope but i think we just need to be aware and start from the inside and move out because the yeah. heart is always causative to the external that's why proverbs 4:23 says keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are all the issues of life all the events of life come from that and then give thanks with a grateful heart. You know, First Thessalonians 5.18, uh, give thanks always for all things, and for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. That means giving thanks is always right. You don't have to always give thanks for the evil things, but you recognize God is allowing it for a reason. So it starts, starts from the bottom up. Yeah, it does, in the thanks. inside out. Thank you well, for coming hey, on. Thanks yeah. for, we just uh, want to say, I'm gonna speak to the audience here because like, I always got to do this sure. at the end that yeah. like, we talk about Thanksgiving and we it's been great to learn some of the true history of it. And we notice that the only one who gives true peace and unity in these situations is Christ. And that's the only way that we're going to solve any of the problems that we're facing in regards to unity or any other issue. Because he's the God of the universe and he's the only one that can solve the sin problem of our hearts. So as we go forward, and I hope you guys all have a happy Thanksgiving for those watching. Um, Try to just remember that and keep our eyes on Christ, not on politics and not on the left-right game. So, Good. Amen. Awesome. God bless. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you next time. <laughs>